We are live. We are live. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Check Tech Chat Tuesdays uh, for Tuesday, May 18th. I'm Ken Rimple. I'm C. John Capadia. And, you know, we're uh, coming to you from Chariot Solutions. Uh, briefly, I wanted to mention that on our website, um, we have a blog and we've got videos. So um, if you go to our blog page, which is under resources blog, you'll see articles about some products we're working on. For example, this uh, uh, journal, my health application, um, uh, some talks around that. And then also we have a lot of tech talks, um, you know, topics like lambdas and different types of development styles, interviews with people. Uh, if you go further down, you'll see all sorts of uh, topics on Java and JavaScript and all sorts of other languages, Python, AWS. So it's a really good resource. Um, you'll find our podcast, if you just found this through Google, at Resources Podcast, and that's the Tech Chat Tuesdays. You can grab that from the uh, RSS or iTunes feed right there or from any of your favorite podcatchers. And if you hit our uh, YouTube, Carriot Solutions with one O, <laughs> uh, you'll find a whole lot of playlists there. Um, in a couple months, we will have all of our Philly Emerging Technologies for the Enterprise uh, 2021 online, but you can go back to every other year we've had and a whole bunch of different slices of things. Look at all the archives of this show. Uh, you name it, it's all there. So, you know, we're, we're kind of taking a little bit of a breather between our, our conferences and different events, but uh, we just finished Philly ETE 2021 and uh, it was a great success. Uh, so there's a lot of content there and more coming. So with that, why don't we talk a little bit, Sujan, about, we'll start off with a Mac. So, uh, you know, everyone's raving, at, at least from an initial uh, interaction with the M1 Macintoshes, they're finding that they're really, they feel very fast, um, very short response times, um, you know, almost immediate kind of feeling. You click on a dock item and it doesn't even bounce more than once before, before the windows show up and things like that. And certainly a lot of that is due to the, to the you know, system on a chip and the memory being integrated directly with the CPU as opposed to being across a longer bus and so on. Um, but also it's about the quality of service of different things. So this is an article from the Electric Light Company, uh, electriclight.com. Uh, What's that? Oh, the Eclectic Light Company. Yes, because the Electric Light Company would be uh, not existing anymore. Um, okay, so... So you can see we've got um, different types of operations, uh, whether it's Intel or ARM cores. Um, generally, uh, operations have to be scheduled on the CPU. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of different scheduling. Did you ever play around, Sujan, with Android schedulers? Like when you're setting up Android ROMs years ago, did you ever do that? I have not done that, no. So one of the things you could do if you were building, and this is one of these things where I had a couple tablets that were Samsung tablets, and they didn't update the uh, the, the the version of um, Android that often. And so what you would do is eventually get frustrated and say, I want to get the latest version of Android to get the latest widgets and stuff. And so you would go out and look on the open source market and find, oh, here's here are different kernels that people built in different Android versions. And one of the things you could pick was the type of scheduler to use for your CPU. And this is something that's baked into an operating system where you don't really normally think about it normally. Yeah. Um, had, to write, bottom, yeah, had to write those in an operating systems class in, in college, like you know, different types of schedulers based off of different criteria. Like preempting each other or one has a higher priority. Correct, round robin, preempting. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. So yeah. apparently um, there is a, uh, there's four levels of schedulers that they have. Um, in their schedule, there's four levels of priority for quality of service from background task, which is the lowest, to user interactive, which is the highest. Um, and so basically they are now using that to make sure that user interaction is really in the forefront, bless you, normally yeah. in the forefront of everything. You know, in Windows even, you get a, a chance to go into the, the settings and pick like, do you want foreground applications to have more priority or background applications to be, uh, you know, if you're doing a server, you want the background applications to get more priority. What's novel about this is how they segregate the workloads uh, to a different set of cores. They have performance cores and efficiency cores. And as Apple, you know, they always care about the user and the UI. Um, the things that are user space operations or things that are, um, you know, the, the, the graphics thread, the rendering thread, things like that, um, they are done on the performance cores so the responsiveness is as the best it can be and you get low latency and so things look snappy from the user's perspective and then the efficiency cores are running 
some of the lower level background things in this article, they give an example of a time machine backup that mm. um, the person running it didn't realize like how actually ridiculously slow the time machine backup was. It was like 15 minutes for transferring one, one gig of data over to a backup. But the computer was running so snappy because all the user land stuff was running on the performance cards that they didn't even realize. Um, so it, it, it makes it, it makes it it's a great thing for I think the average typical user. Yeah, it seems like they're doing kind of multi-processing and getting things done in the background. It might be a little difficult. I'm hoping you can pin things, um, but I haven't looked far enough to see um, where you can say, you know, I really want this to be in the foreground. Um, uh, for, you, can, for you can pick. I mean, you can pick the quality of service level that you want to apply to a process. And I'm assuming if you're a developer, that you, you can tweak it more. Right, right. I'll have to see what the new activity monitor looks like if I get one of these at some point, and see if we can right click and say make this a performance. But it, it's really not so much the process; it's the threads within it. So I'm not sure how you would do that. Yeah. Interesting though. So yeah, quality of service is at work, and so this is an example of them t taking the things that really matter to the user, the snappiness and putting them in those high speed cores and putting other things on slower cores. Yeah, it's pretty, now. it's pretty cool how they're becoming, again, just, I think we've talked about this before, but because you're hitting hitting limits and, and how many transistors you can have on it, on a size die, they're becoming more more and more specialized um, to, to eke out more, more performance. I'm really curious to see what happens in the future. I know they're uh, allegedly working on, you know, newer, larger MacBooks and, um, you know, Mac Pros and things like that, allegedly, uh, and that they're supposed to be working on potentially more cores, more memory, things like that. So, you know, even for, you know, people doing audio and video, they're finding that look at the 16 gig of RAM with a an M1 MacBook Mini, it's just, it's searing through things. Yeah. Um, IBM, last Mac week, Mini. IBM last week announced a, uh, I haven't read the article all the way through, but a two nanometer process. Mm. Um, yeah. So that, that should be interesting. That's amazing. What are the, what are these down to? Is it five? I think it is, or seven. I think these are five. Okay, so just imagine that's that's like less than half of it, right? So, yeah. Atoms don't have to move so far. It's got to be really fast. But a bigger piece of news for us is uh, for developers is if you're a Scala developer, Scala three is here. Yeah. So let's talk so about that. Scala three has been in development for uh, over eight years. Um, it, there was a experimental compiler that Martin Odersky and others were working on called Dotty, D-O-T-T-Y. Right. Um, that was sort of the experimental branch, try out a lot of different things and proposals, and then parts of that were basically carried over into the main line, which is now Scala 3. Mm -hmm. um, I have not looked into what it would take to port Scala 2 Xcode over to Scala 3 and what are all the implications there and um, how much of the community is going to be moving over to that and libraries, et cetera. But, uh, Apparently, there's a new simpler syntax, um, and they list like what that is, um, which will be probably the first thing people notice when they're looking at new Scala three. Because like, oh, okay, um, there's certain cases where you don't use braces anymore with conditional and control structures. Um, another thing they've done is if if you're if you're a Scala developer, um, you know about implicit variables, implicit functions, implicit resolution. It's uh, something that's um, very hotly debated. It's, it's very powerful, um, and it does things like Haskell-like things, like type class pattern and inferencing. But it's also very confusing, very complicated in, in the resolution rules, and it can be over-abused and to the point where you don't know what the code is doing and where something is implicitly being resolved, um, increases compilation times. But anyway, apparently that's all been very heavily revised. Um, I need to review that in more detail. Mm -hmm. Still, like there's a number of things you have to consider. Remember, they're like, I don't know, something like 10 bullet points. So it, it, it's been simplified, but it's still complex. Um, anyway, if you're if you're interested in functional programming languages, you're interested in languages that can go and pure functional, um, definitely take a look at this. Where, uh, is that me? I think that might be me. Okay, I'll wait. Uh, you know, keep talking. I'm going to mute myself. Go ahead. Okay. Um, definitely take a look at Scala 3. It'll be interesting to see how, how it gets adopted, how, how widely it, it spreads out from here. Um, probably be a long time where you're going to have Scala 2 and 3 um, in the ecosystem. Also, another thing, Scala 3 has uh, heavily updated or revised macros, which can be extremely powerful. Again, complex feature, <clears throat> advanced, it's powerful. you got to understand 
where and how to use it. Um, it, it Stalin gives you a lot of foot guns, as one of my coworkers likes to say. <laughs> you need to be careful of how you uh, how you end up using it. In uh, what uh, what what's been happening over the years is like ideas from Scala tend to get emulated or adopted in things like Kotlin or Java or Swift even. So it's interesting how Scala ends up being sort of an experimental playground for things that other languages sometimes adopt. So it'll be interesting to see it, will Scala three serve the same role and, and things from it will be adopted into other um, other languages. Gotcha, gotcha. Good, interesting. Oh, um, one yeah. of the messages, uh, so one, a, a person we've worked with in the past who we have a lot of respect for, uh, Michael Pilquist, um, who works for Comcast. Uh, he is uh, very well known in the Scala ecosystem and he has a number of functional libraries out there and he's maintainer and committer on them. He has uh, five commits credited to him for, for Scala 3. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I'm sure if anyone we know would be, it would be Michael Pilquist. So shout out to Michael Pilquist. Good man. Awesome. All right. Uh, I switched back to my laptop uh, audio, so hopefully it's not too bad because um, I think it's a cable. All right, let's take a look at uh, another thing. So Apple and Microsoft's rivalry had cooled, but now it's back and it's getting testier. This is the uh, the Bloomberg Business Week, it looks like. Tech and Transformation Watch. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Mark Gurman is the article uh, uh, writer. I want to bring back the good old days of you know Microsoft and Apple rivalry. I, I feel Ugh. I feel like things are going back again in cyclical. So it makes me I, I like cycles because then I know what to expect. Um, <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if folks have been following Apple and Epic Games, at one point Fortnite was booted out of the App Store, and, and Epic Games it has, has filed a lawsuit against, I believe it's a lawsuit against Apple, um, and some other companies have uh, followed suit, no pun intended, and supporting Epic Games, Microsoft being one of them. Um, the, the, the contention is that Apple's App Store and the way they control the App Store is monopolistic, um, which I have, I have various thoughts about because... Apple created the devices. It's their hardware. It's their software. They're allowed to have an app store for their own devices. And yes, they're allowed to like say that only our app store is going to be the compatible app store for our devices. They're the ones who invested all the time and effort and IP into that. You can, you can, you can, there's various, you can question their business model around it and how much they charge developers. Um, and how that works and what they allow and don't allow and how they police the app store um, in terms of being a walled garden or stifling competition. There are, I, I feel, um, valid concerns around that. But just to say like, hey, the apps, you have an app store and it's the only app store and it's, that's a monopoly. Like it's their system. It's their products. Like, so I, I don't buy that. But anyway, um, Microsoft, because they're also getting into gaming and mixed reality headsets and and streaming services and et cetera. Like they are playing in the same space as Apple more and more. So this is becoming a thing now where they're concerned about Apple's app store stifling their competition and their ability to either have their own store, or distribute games on Apple devices, et cetera. Um, so if you're interested in, in that um, and where that may end up going, um, I would read this article and, and, and kind of follow that. Microsoft um, obviously is very different from the Microsoft back in the day big proponents of open source, providing a lot of code back to the industry, doing a lot of things with Linux and Windows, you know, subsystem for Linux and, and making it easier and easier to run different workloads on different platforms on Windows. Um, and Microsoft is su supporting that heavily um, and then you know, Visual Studio code and IDs and development. So they're kind of all over the place and they're doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, it'll be interesting to see where where this goes and what it means for uh, content creators, developers, and device manufacturers and things like that. I um I don't know. It, it I if Apple is the final say in whether something gets approved or not, which I believe it is, I, I can see that being a concern for people now that there's so many devices out there. And I don't I think Microsoft is out of the device game, right? They're not building their own phones anymore like they were at one or working with Nokia and had their own OS. I don't think they're doing that anymore, right? They kind of canned all that. I think they did. Um, I mean, there's still, um, from the from the PC side of things, there's still a Microsoft store, right? You still have the Microsoft application right. store. So they do, they, you know, it's interesting. I, I wonder if their policies are different. Um, you know, like there's Chrome store for the Chrome browser. 
you know, you install, your, but you can still upload extensions and install them kind of like side sidecar install them. So what do you call it? Um, side load them, I guess is the right term. Um, you know, so there's that. Excuse me. So something uh, kill they, the bug. they mentioned the article, like right now, Microsoft is distributing some stuff via the web. Um, to, to, to basically circumvent some of these, um, you know, app store, walled garden type, type. Uh, but then the experience is, is not as smooth or streamlined because you're doing it over the web. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of like one of these things where you could look at either of them and say, yeah, but you do or did some of the same things. Like there's, you know, the, the, the cloud environment that, that Apple and Microsoft both have. I mean, Microsoft, I think, is much more in corporations than Apple is with you know OneDrive versus iCloud Drive. It's more consumer, so they're different audiences. Um, I think there's also like the play of Microsoft versus AWS or Microsoft versus Google from the cloud side. I'd be curious to see where that's headed as well. And speaking of, let me see if I can find this in here. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring this one up. Nope, that's not it. Hold on, where is the darn thing? Here it is. I want to jump to this now. It's only a hacker news item that I. Have I don't have the original plugin itself. <laughs> speaking of extensions and speaking of like stores, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the Chrome extension, and that's spelled wrong, from Microsoft uh, called Microsoft Authenticator wasn't from Microsoft. Someone published this thing um, and they claimed that it was from Microsoft itself. And it even said that the organization was offered by Microsoft Corporation. Yeah. So let's let's take like the, the walled garden versus the semi-walled holes in the wall garden where you can publish hold something. Hold in the wall garden, that's great. <laughs> so yeah, it's like, it, it's, it depends on how good your curation is. If you're gonna put a store up there and you're gonna let anyone publish the store, this reminds me of like when you publish a repository uh, in Java and you can push it up there, there's a lot more control that you have to go through, to go through Nexus and sure. install it on Sonatype's repository than there is, let's say, to do an NPM publish where anyone in the world could do an NPM publish. And so while you have more control, there's a lot more danger there because that means anyone can have that kind of control. So um, this is an interesting article. Take a look at it. Definitely take a look at the uh, somewhat salty comments. Um, but uh, there's some good information in here. Some, some, you know, like how do you know something's legit or not, for example? I, I take this whole general topic, like the other article, is like each company wants their own monopoly. So mm -hmm. support the monopolies. No doubt. Absolutely. Oh, it's fun. Okay. Let's talk about, whoa, Amazon Sidewalk Network. Okay. So there's lots, if you guys know about the Amazon Echo and Dot, you know, yep. voice, virtual voice system devices of which there's like millions of them out there now. I'd show mine, but it's full of toothpaste that my kids use in the bathroom to play audio. <laughs> Darn. Huh. Yeah. Streaming live from Ken's house, his bathroom. <laughs> no one ever wants to stream that. Anyway, go ahead. So... By default, these devices now have enabled this thing called uh, Sidewalk, which is a mesh network that allows, you're essentially extending meshing your Wi-Fi, right? So you have your home Wi-Fi network. You uh -huh. have your Amazon devices on that Wi-Fi network. And then other Amazon devices in proximity of that or in proximity of your phone, which are then proximity of other Amazon devices on other people's Wi-Fi or public Wi-Fi, um, they can be, uh, Mesh, each, mesh that way and communicate with each other. So what that means is, for example, a use case they provide is um, tiles, which is like a beacon, sort of like you can attach a tile to something and then locate it by a Bluetooth or whatever um, mm -hmm. within certain range. Like, okay, I left my keys here or my wallet or whatever. And uh, now what it can do is because these devices can be meshed, my tile could be, let's say, at my friend's house down the street. Um, and if I try to determine where my where my uh, tile is, it used to be just like, okay, I either in Bluetooth range or not. But now that tile can communicate on that Wi-Fi to like an Amazon device, which can then take you back to another one and then basically chain it back to your network and, and your like locator app. So now you can kind of communicate with things that are outside of your Wi-Fi, right? And you're just extending basically the range of your network. So there's all sorts of security and privacy concerns around this and the fact that it's enabled by default. Um, now, obviously for Amazon, there can be a lot of use cases here, not just for virtual assistant, but data collection, um, 
uh, communication, messaging, um, things around like package delivery and, and tracking and, and all sorts of stuff where you're like this one network. Uh, so that to me, I, I still like, this is not something that I would want on. I'd want to immediately turn it off. And I, and I still question really um, how useful this is. Maybe in certain emergency, emergency first responder situations, having, having more connectivity is nice. But I think there's a lot of cons to it as well when it comes to security and privacy. So it's under your settings, I guess this is in the uh, the web app perhaps or something or the or the or the app. It's the mobile app. You go to settings, account settings, Amazon Sidewalk, and you remove the enabled setting. You turn it off. It's opt out, not opt in. Yeah. And I didn't get a notification that I know of that it was available. So if you're gonna start sipping bandwidth from me to make a mesh network, I'd want to know. Yeah, or like, you know, like Ring, right? I, I think a lot of this they're mm -hmm. going to start integrating with uh, Ring, which they own now. It imagine you know in, in a security event or a break in occurring down the street again, and that can like either notify everyone who's connected on your mesh within your neighborhood that this incident. There again, there are some pros, but I feel I, I I think maybe the cons outweigh the pros. I don't know. I just would want to know. Like it, it should be something easy to know about and easy to monitor. Um, and and to know exactly what it's going to be used for, uh, you know, it's definitely there's the whole like you know Apple versus other companies philosophy where you know these features are making your devices have an extended uh, outreach and inreach to them. Whereas with the iPhone now, like in the newest iOS eleven point five point one or two, whatever the version is, now it's basically you can opt out of every communication by default and say you know what I don't want devices uh, knowing what I'm doing. I don't want to share my information with anybody else. You know, I'm sure there's other things you don't know about that are being shared as well, but uh, it's just an interesting kind of difference between the two companies' approaches. Yeah, yeah the fact that it's on by default to me is really, uh, really bad. Yeah, that, that is something I wonder about. Well, here's something near and dear to my heart, and I'm glad you brought this up because I love database weenie talk. I just love tech uh, information about relational databases. The first thing I really gravitated towards when I was a wee young in, in IT, I was in college and, okay, this is in 1874, but actually it's 19, uh, what would be 87, 88. Someone introduced me to Oracle and they had Oracle databases and I learned relational theory, relational calculus. And, and for me, I just loved relational databases. And it, all the way through my career, I was always fascinated with how to tune databases. So this looks like a really good trio of articles around SQL indexing. Yeah, it, it so what'd you find? Um, this gets into quite a bit of detail, but it presents. Oh, I should say this is from Topdol from um, Mir Mirko Marovic. Yeah, um, he's a. I think it's titled like Database and Performance Tuning Expert, and so he has a three-part series on explaining kind of what indices are, mm -hmm. how they're structured, what they look like under the hood, where you use them, how to use them for different types of queries. You know date ranges, range queries, um, you know, in indexes versus full table scans and, and when one makes sense, when the other makes sense, covering yeah. covering indices, um, B tree indexes, um, global indexes or, or full text indexes and things like databases are very powerful now. So you have things like Postgres where you have, J you can have JSON and JSON B fields and you can have full text indices, global indices or still the traditional B tree based index. But anyway, this gets, into different types of indices, what they are with and without, what the performance implications are when you add an index and run a query and when you don't, and when to use one or the other. Um, and it kind of builds up the mental model from the first to the third article. But it's really nice if you want to learn more about indices. And um, Pardon me. Sure. <laughs> I, like that. I like the sound. Um, yeah, it makes me notice it. <laughs> it uh, it's, it's comprehensive at a high level. Um, and again, yeah. the reason I like these kind of things is seeing how things work under the hood is nice. And databases are so fascinating. Um, you can learn most of what you need about computer science and software engineering by learning how databases are implemented and how they behave. And it, it's actually a great project. Like if you were to have a four year or two year college, you know, something in where the, an interesting project throughout that whole course would be building a database because you can learn all the things you need to learn about design and architecture, performance, data structures. You have to learn about the metal um, and how they're stored. It's just databases basically cover everything. 
You know, I used to teach uh, databases a lot in the 90s. and okay. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. That was like one of the biggest things I did was uh, SQL Server was and Sybase were my two big databases. I was a certified DBA and all sorts of stuff. And and I would spend a lot of time explaining like cluster versus non-clustered indexes and yeah. covered queries. It was a really, really, really good performance tuning course that had like a binder like this thick that Sybase had that was fantastic for their database. And, you know, a lot of databases don't let you sort the table by the index, right? They Or at least they don't give you control over it for the simpler databases. But when you can, especially doing range searches, that's a, a nice technique. Like if you're doing a between and you can sort the rows into the between order and slurp them all like a, a modified mini table scan, really cool thing, unless you have tons of updates and all of a sudden it gets fragmented and then you have to manage the indexes and it just goes on and on. But if you don't know anything about indexing in SQL, you're missing a huge opportunity to learn about how to get things done quicker and how to, you know, not hurt your system by over indexing, for example. Yeah. So the um, stuff you just mentioned, they actually talk about in this series. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're interested in this and want to learn more, check out this blog series from Mirko um, on top. Okay. okay, great. Awesome. And Google IO starts today, I see. Yeah, it starts at 1 p.m. Eastern. I have registered. Um, I don't know if I'm actually going to have any time to attend right away. Um, maybe I'll try to catch something later on tonight. Uh, but they're going to be talking about uh, Android devices, a new Android OS, and, and what that's going to look like. Um, they may talk about the Pixel 5a and Pixel 6. Pixel 5a is like the next gen phone that I don't think is going to come out right away due to chip shortages. Pixel mm -hmm. 6 is their they, their future like flagship phone where they're building their own silicon, their own chip in in collaboration with Samsung. Um, so that'll be interesting. They're going to talk about Android Wear OS and, and updates to that, and maybe their rumors around like whether they're going to come out with a Pixel branded watch. Um, that'll be their own watch right now. Like the popular ones are Samsung um, that runs on Samsung's ver variant of the operating system. But I think Samsung is going to either switch to or provide the option of having a stock Wear OS experience on their devices as well. So there's a lot of stuff they're going to go over, not even covering 1% of it. I'm sure there's a lot of cloud computing and machine learning and AI um, updates as well. So, um, and then, yeah, Pixel Buds, there you go. So <laughs> Pixel <laughs> Buds, yeah. if you're interested in, in in Google or you have Google devices or Android or if you use Google Cloud um, cl Cloud Compute. Definitely check it out. Cool. Here's a question, Mark. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to, it's free. Yeah. Oh, it's free, so, yes. Um, virtual and free, so anyone can attend, no limit. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the next article I have, I'm not trying to troll, so I'll just start with that. Um, it's more of, I thought this was an interesting article. Also, I love that show. Um, community, what is it? That's uh, Parks and Rec. Um, okay. The mortifying ordeal of being known. Um, so this is a, a tale uh, Nat Bennett wrote. Uh, it's it's a, an interesting uh, perspective of, of, of theirs, talking about whether it makes sense to pair program all day, every day. And I think this, to me, the analogy is like, can you be on Zoom all day, every day? Because it's kind of the same kind of draining experience of being constantly engaged with someone else and not kind of having an ability to kind of go to your corner and think and work on something and have your brain rest. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to pair all day for everybody. In fact, a lot of people seem to really like it. A lot of teams really get a lot out of it. But this person has an entire kind of, uh, article on how difficult it was and how it basically created burnout. The company they were working for is Pivotal, which we both know for uh, the company that uh, ultimately purchased Spring and and then you know uh, everything uh, with Cloud Foundry and things like that. Um, but they paired for eight hours a day on on average uh, on everything. And though it was very good, eventually it started to really burn that person out. Um, I could see the perspective of this. Like I I have not worked on a project where I did nothing but pair all day, every day for months. Um, I think sometimes you need time to just kind of collect your thoughts and think about things and plan and organize and sometimes do research on your own. Um, so I wonder, I mean, what do you think, Sujan, in terms of like people out there pairing? Do you see it as like being an activity that more people do periodically? That's what I've seen. Like you don't um, pair every day or all day, every day on everything. Yeah, I, I would say that in my experience, periodically has worked really well. I was on yeah. a speed project, Extreme Programming, um, uh, Agile Discipline by Ken Beck, who, by the way, spoke at ETE um, and, and keynoted, uh, so definitely yeah. check that out. But 
So for six months, I was on a project where we probably, I would say, paired 75% of the time. So it was a high level of pairing Sure. It wasn't all the time, though. Um, a lot of times we, we use the pairing for um, things that were very unknown or very complex. Um, yeah. Once a pattern was set or a solution was determined and it, there was some repetitive code after that on certain things, the repetitive pieces, once the decisions were made, could be like, all right, now let's split up and, and do those parts independently because if we were to pair if we were to pair on the repetitive things it would actually you'd be losing productivity because two people could actually get double the work done by separating out but anything where we had a lot of discussion back and forth and, and breaking new territory or ground um, we paired and that worked out really well for multiple reasons I mean one obviously like one person is focused on typing one person is thinking you're getting constant code reviews you're getting you know different viewpoints different biases um things like that so it, it and the net was that it was really well done really mm -hmm. high quality code um we all ended up being really close and bonded with each other after the six months but the 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 thing is you have to be able to bond with those people so if there's people that you don't get along with or you're there's a different different philosophy different way of thinking and you're not going to get on to have to be forced to do it for a long period of time over and over again when there's clearly other issues around, um, that's challenging and that can lead to burnout because you're, it's more than just coding now, there's this constant psychological thing that's going on. But I still think the, the benefits outweigh the cost. Um, you just gotta know when and where to use it. And yeah. I, like one thing, this one positive thing, uh, the person, uh, what's the, sorry, who's the, who wrote the article? Uh, Nat Bennett, and I should say, I'm not coming down or neither of us coming down on the side of or against what he went through, uh, this person went through, I should say. So it's more of their experience yeah. um, than anything else. One uh, one quote from the article I, I thought was really interesting was, we enter drift together, we make decisions as one. This mm -hmm. is the real power of pairing, intense pairing. Talking about what you're doing and adjusting it based on the input of other humans becomes automatic. Um, that is really cool where you, you start thinking like one entity yeah. Way and things just become more smooth, more fluid. There's there's less stalling and there's uh, less communication overhead with pairing, which is nice. And it's nice because as as you said, as one person is on control of the keyboard and one person is kind of doing that, observing and thinking it strategically versus the tactical, and you switch, you get breaks mentally from those forms of thinking, and you're more fresh at those times. And and you're right. It, it is like you have a shorthand together, which is really great. Now, what I've never done, which a person that ET spoke about um, in our pregame show, I forget the person's name, sorry, um, talking about mob programming. I've never done that where like everyone's swarming together on the same piece. So if you have a team of five people, five people are mobbing together to finish that task. And it seems like that's exactly like if there's something brand new, but people have different skills they're all contributing different ideas from their experience to it. it sounds like it's actually pretty fabulous. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I didn't want to really like say, oh, Pivotal's a problem. God forbid I'm saying that. I'm not. Um, it's just an interesting angle of, and I think one of the biggest problems that probably really put a wedge in it is the pandemic happened. And if you think about how everyone was, their lives have been thrown up in the air for the pandemic with personal issues and non-personal issues and being able to work from home and some not being able to work from home and, zoom and figuring all that out and having kids around you and trying to get anything done with a bunch of kids in the house like that would just make trying yeah. to pair all day impossible yeah. you know that that's the hard that's the part i have a hard time understanding like pairing is great but if it's forced upon you all the time it's hard that leading to burnout and in, i don't know if this is the case in pivotal um yeah but in some cases you have very widely varying degrees of skill level or, or capability so which so there's Good pros and cons of that because that can help someone learn from someone more senior and level up faster. But at the same time, if if it always stays that way, where like essentially one person is, is doing a lot of the work and the other person is following all the time, that does, does can become a burden and a stress stressor for that person who who's now not only having to code but having to like code and mentor and teach all the time every day while they're doing their work, um, that can lead to burnout. So if, if companies are considering teams, you wanna do it, um, tr think about who you're pairing up with who and how that is and, and test it out before you decide to like, hey, let's just keep doing this. Run a few sprints and see what, what get everyone's feedback in a retrospective. 
Yeah, it's a good point. And you know, I, I come from like the mentoring and education side of things. So personally for me, it's really gratifying when I can pair with somebody and kind of help them with things that they don't know. And I, I being that kind of person, I love learning things from the people during pairing. So I'm probably set up the right way to really enjoy pair programming, but I, I couldn't do eight plus hours a day of pairing. It would be, you just need that mental time to let your brain reset a little bit. To, yeah, like so just a quick thing before we move on. Like for example, yeah. things like I remember uh, variable naming Everyone, mm -hmm. has, that would become a thing. Like when now you're discussing variable naming, and sometimes that's fun and, and like is comedic, but other times it's like, I don't want to have, like, I, let's just move forward. Let's, let's not argue about what we're going to name this variable. Yeah. Call it foo for now. We'll rename it at the end. Right. Then we'll have that argument over beers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, and then there's one last one. And I just thought this was kind of fun to talk about. So this is going to be kind of a random uh, uh, thought process, but. Uh, we have here uh, an article on state machines uh, from, uh, a gr I love this website named nullprogram.com. <laughs> Chris Wellens. Um, so so I don't know this person. I, I just saw this on the Hacker News and on the uh, Hack URL site, but talking about state machines. And I know it's like, especially on the website, you know, if you're a web server, you don't want to hold on to state. If you have a single page application, the state can live in the database or it can live in the front end. But you know, if you're going to use it in the app server, then you can't easily scale it and cluster it and load balance it, you know, uh, without dealing with state. So what we're talking about is really state machine concept here and, and applying state machines to things. You had to bring up single page apps. I knew somehow you'd weave it in. You know me. It's got to be something <laughs> like that. Yes. So or okay, forget that. Let's say it's a simple um, Spring Spring Boot application and it's got state in the middle tier. The minute you put the state in the middle tier, all of a sudden it's hard to scale that up. Because now all of a sudden, if you're running state machines, you have to have sticky sessions back to those servers that have the state machines so you can still keep them, or you have to have the state and the state machine replicated in the caching engine. So this is not to say state machines are a perfect panacea for everything. But I love I'm, state machines. They're mm -hmm. uh, I was so glad you, you brought this article up. Uh, I, I actually read it last night and I think you know, state machines are freaking awesome. They can lead to very concise, easily readable and testable code. Yeah. Um, they can be hard coded. They can be data driven. Um, they're really good at times. Even if you don't end up coding something in a state machine, they can be good for communicating processes to other developers or analysts. Yeah. Um, so languages like Scala and Erlang, they have really good pattern matching capabilities. So you're able to build really nice, um, clean, finite state machines. Um, so like, for example, in Scala, the, when, when I did it a lot um, for communication and, and protocol development, so handling messages coming in and a protocol um, or a connection um, state machines are really good for connection state management um, mm -hmm. and messages. And also for like things like deferred execution, continuations, or asynchronous patterns, they end up sort of being state machines by their very nature. You know, I was just working with uh, Don on a, a project that we use state machines. We use the step functions in AWS, where basically we could have Lambda stepping through different Lambda calls as a state machine. And I thought that, you know, for the overhead it took to figure it out, the nice thing was you have this nice visual graphic of what's happening in each job mm -hmm. and you see exactly what states it went through. You see, you can look at each node, see what went in, see what went out, see what kind of issues came from each. Um, and I really, you know, I had never worked with those before and Don showed it to me for this project he worked on. I gotta say it's fantastic. Like if you really have to do something on a, a you know, like a data processing path, and you have different transforms that have to happen in the data processing path and different things that have to happen. Um, it's a nice way of doing it in the cloud, you know, and you're still doing lambdas, you're not running servers. Uh, I, it gave me a new appreciation for how to approach, I wanna say stateless state machines, but that's not right, uh, serverless state machines uh, in the cloud. So step functions were interesting for that. You yep. wanna check them out. Cool, and it's a lot of neat examples of like, you know, doing word counts in a state machine and, you know, uh, how to approach it, you know, coroutines and generators and a whole bunch of things. So it's definitely one to look at uh, if you whet you know, your appetite. I always find that like uh, just going through the state of the system is absolutely a critical thing to do. Like if you're if you're not sure what the state flow of some system is, that's a really important diagram to write and things to think through. And yeah. you start, you, you just you're able you know, to identify gaps like, oh, I didn't think of this, this one transition or this one state. Like maybe this handoff is a lot more complex than you thought it was. You right. know, maybe there needs to be a second step in there, um, or maybe you see duplication of effort. And you're like, well, I'm seeing these three three paths that seem similar. Can I simplify these? And so it, it is another way of looking at things that's really, 
I still think it's old, but it's really handy, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, listen, if you liked what we did today, uh, please send feedback our way. You can hit us at techcastfeedback at cherrysolutions.com or tweet to us at, at techcast. We would love to hear from you. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe uh, on the video, of course. So, you know, you click on the uh, subscribe, you'll be able to know when things happen. You click on the like the little bell, it's going to let you know when we are broadcasting. Uh, and again, thank you very much. Uh, and we will be here. We're doing two weeks now, I think, right? I think we're doing every other yeah. week. All right. Yeah, we're kind of pulling back because it's the summer soon. And uh, it just gives us a little bit more of a breather to have good weeks like this where we have a lot of articles. So see you in two weeks. Uh, for the for the te chat Tuesdays, I'm Ken Rimple. I'm Sujan Kapadia. And uh, Cherry is hiring. So check out yes. the pay, uh, page for open positions and reach out to you know me, Ken, anyone. Um, on our team uh, if you're interested in learning more. Yeah, please do. All right. Have a good week.